If you've spent even the smallest bit of time on the internet, then you've most likely encountered a creepy thing or two either being shared, archived, or just out of happenstance. These oddities can exist anywhere from the darkest corners of the deep web, or even right there in plain sight. Welcome back to Disturbing Things from Around the Internet. If you're new, then grab a drink, pop open a bag of your favorite chips, and get comfy. This is my series that dives into bite-sized, creepy, and disturbing internet oddities from all over the internet. If you'd like to get caught up, I have a dedicated playlist on my channel to ensure that you have hours of content to fish through that'll surely leave you up at night. With that out of the way, it's time, with our guest, Scare Theater, to dive into five more hand-picked and disturbing things from around the internet. This first entry comes from a Spanish Facebook page called Noticias de Cuernavaca. In this post, they claim that this footage comes from the historic center of Cuernavaca. The video that we're showing here was recorded by a policeman at his guard at approximately 4 in the morning. The nearby tenants say that this is not the first time that this has happened. The video that they attached is some simple cell phone footage that lasts 50 seconds long. In this, you're able to hear a woman scream that sounds like it was pulled straight out of a nightmare. If you're unfamiliar with Mexican folklore, La Llorona, which translates to the Weeping Woman, is a popular urban legend that dates back to the 1960s. Legend has it that this woman lost her children, and now cries while aimlessly wandering around in search of them. If she's ever encountered, she's known for causing great misfortune to those that approach her. Whether or not this is an actual spirit screaming, or somebody having a manic episode and breaking down in the near distance, it's hard to discount the fact that this scream sounds completely genuine and would undoubtedly freeze you in your tracks if you were ever to hear this yourself. On December 22nd, 2018, Tragedy would befall the Sunda Strait regions of Indonesia. Completely without warning, the Anak Krakatau, also known as the Child of Krakatoa Volcano, would erupt, causing an undersea landslide that ultimately would result in the devastating tsunami that ended up killing 429 and injuring 1,459 residents. Apparently, this volcano had been spewing ash and lava for months prior to when a 158-acre section of its southwest side collapsed, resulting in the massive undersea landslide and wiping out the volcanic island in its entirety. The photos and video from the aftermath of this natural disaster are absolutely devastating, and one event in particular is chilling. Reminiscent of the Station Nightclub fire, Footage was caught at a concert where the pop band Seventeen was energetically playing. In this footage, all seemed to be going well, and everybody appeared to be having a great time, with nothing out of the ordinary. This enjoyment would unfortunately be short-lived, as it captures the moments leading up to the calamity. Tepuk tangan 
Among the 429 that were killed, two of those were in the band themselves. We lost our bassist, Banny, and our road manager, Oki, the lead singer cried. The heartbreaking thing about this entire tragedy was that it was so sudden. No warning, no preparation, no sound for alarm, just mother nature in a fit of rage wiping out everything in sight. Since the event, people have pled to have some sort of volcanic eruption or landslide detection system put into place. Indonesia must build an early warning system for tsunamis that are generated by underwater landslides and volcanic eruptions. Landslide triggered in the 1992 and the 2018 tsunamis. As recovery efforts continue, this, alongside every other natural disaster that occurs, is a very humbling example of how helpless we can really be against the unstoppable forces of nature itself. A woman by the name of Maribel Ramos was an Iraq war veteran and college student back in 2013. With a dream of a career in law enforcement, she was taking classes alongside caring for her sick mother. She apparently lived with a 55-year-old man by the name of Casey Joy, and according to him, they were extremely close. In May 2nd of that year, Maribel would fail to turn up at various events that she was scheduled to show up to, and the very next day, she would officially be reported missing by her family. On May 8th, one of her friends by the name of Emily C, desperate for answers, would spontaneously post a thread on Yelp asking about Maribel. In her post, she claims, My friend Maribel Ramos has been missing since Thursday, May 2nd. She was last seen at her apartment in Orange, California. Please help her family, friends, and I to find her. We need all the help we can get. Shortly after this, a reply would surface by a user named Enrique C who asked if they had talked to the roommate by that point in time. In response, Emily C would claim that, yes, they spoke with the roommate, he willingly cooperated with the cops by giving them DNA samples, and even allowed them to take naked photos of him. He gave up his cell phone to them so he couldn't contact anyone, which he was all more than happy to do. Three days after the exchange between Enrique and Emily, another stranger would interject into the conversation. A user by the name of KCKCK responded by saying, I am Maribel's roommate. She's my BFF and my only family. She is absolutely the best woman I've ever met. We had so much fun together. I miss her so much. She always knew that I will give my life for her without any hesitation. Police forensic team searched this two bedroom apartment five times with the police dog. They confiscated computer, hard drive, cell phone, car, and took several items. They contacted everyone on my phone list and I don't know when I will get my properties back. These are major inconveniences, but all these don't matter. I miss Maribel and that really makes me depressed and stressed out big time. Interestingly, people took notice of his wordage. He consistently referred to Maribel in past tense, without regard that she's only missing, not dead. Why would he spill his heart out like this over a very, very new missing persons case? A user named Grant K was one of many to notice this. May 14th. Am I the only one finding it odd that this Casey roommate posted here and used past tense to refer to Maribel? We had, she always knew, as opposed to we have, or she knows. And why would she ask him to move out if they have so much fun together? Uh, my prayers are with the friends and family. This is very sad. At this point, people retorted at Grant, saying that he shouldn't make such bold assumptions and to let the police do their job, as they should, rather than turning this into a witch hunt. Casey then jumped into the conversation once more in hopes of defending himself, claiming that English is his second language and that he still needs help with that from time to time. He then went forward pleading to others not to make judgments about him and that he, quote, wouldn't give a second to give his life for Maribel. This is when things become strange. The next day, 
He posts multiple times, and each one seems to dig him further and further into the hole of suspicion. May 15th. I love Maribel as a friend and a roommate. This is how we say goodnight to each other. Goodnight Maribel, Maya, Misun, Mom and Dad. My profile photo is because I miss her. That is one from the night we went out. I said, Maribel is my one and only BFF. She is. She is my only beneficiary for my $250,000 life insurance and my only beneficiary for my bank accounts, paid upon death. She knows this. I miss her every second I am awake. A day later, and two weeks after Maribel originally went missing, Emily C. would jump in, updating everybody that a body had been found. However, they don't know if it's Maribel as of yet. They should know by noon that day. And then, later that same day, someone named Thelma D. would drop the verdict on everyone. It's her. And the killer is KC. This entry surrounds a story following two young teenagers, Abigail Williams and Liberty German. The pair were best friends in the 8th grade at Delphi Community Middle School in Delphi, Indiana, a small town of about 3,000 residents. As many teenagers do, the pair were keen on hanging out outside of school, having sleepovers, and going on spontaneous adventures for fun. On the evening of February 12th, 2017, the two would have a sleepover at Liberty's grandparents' house, as schools canceled the following day. The next day, the two girls were trying to figure out how to spend their afternoon and came up with the idea to hike around the Monon Bridge, a popular nearby hangout spot. After receiving consent from Liberty's grandmother and arranging for their grandfather to pick them up a couple hours later, her sister Kelsey would drop the pair off near the bridge at around 1.30 p.m. on her way to work. Throughout the next hour or so, everything was going as usual. Liberty, as many people do, began to share her trek along this bridge on Snapchat, and in this photo, taken at 2.07pm, you can see Abigail smiling as she walks along it. Unbeknownst to everyone though, this would be the last normal photo that Liberty would ever post to her social media. An hour later, Liberty's grandfather arrived to pick the two up, and texted her to meet him at the pickup spot. No response. Realizing this is uncharacteristic of her, he proceeds to call. Still, no answer. It was at this point that he'd walk along the bridge in hopes of finding the girls. However, this too would be futile. In response to his failed efforts, the grandparents would report the girls as missing, and a search was promptly underway. Countless volunteers aided in this, with people scouring the entire area. At around 6 p.m. the following day, the worst would unfortunately unfold. The bodies of two young girls were located in Deer Creek, a mere half a mile from the bridge itself. The girls were confirmed by investigators to be Abigail and Liberty, and with this, the evidence that they gathered and released from Abigail's smartphone would baffle everybody. Police were able to locate this photo of a man walking along the bridge, taken shortly after Liberty's original Snapchat photo and this very, very muffled snippet of audio sounds like a man saying the words, down the hill. Down the hill. Down the hill. It's been widely speculated that the audio and this man are directly connected to their deaths, and it's very possible that this same man was ordering the girls to go to a specific location down a hill before he ended their lives. To this day, the only evidence they have to go off of is that Snapchat, the grainy photo, the audio, and the sketch of the suspect. Everything else surrounding the true whereabouts and identity of the killer remains a mystery to this very day. Since this tragedy, the entire town has since replaced all of their exterior light bulbs with those that have an orange hue, and will keep them as such until the day the killer is found.
Number 5 on our list surrounds an absolutely haunting 911 call made by a woman by the name of Ruth Price. Apparently, Price lived completely alone, and late one night, she noticed a man walking around outside of her home. Understandably shaken, she immediately calls 911 in hopes of getting help. However, what transpires afterwards is undoubtedly something that will disturb you. What's the problem, ma'am? Oh, well, there's some guy been uh, checking the place out. Oh, well, he went in the back. I have an apartment in the back, and he said he was looking for a guy. And he comes to my door. And yes. And I uh, said he's uh, looking for an apartment. So I'm, I live alone, and I'm an old lady. While the validity of this voicemail is up for heavy debates, it's almost impossible not to be at least somewhat unnerved by this. It's hard to find any concrete case behind this recording, and it's unclear if Ruth Price is her real name, or simply an alias. Since the recording, this call has been used in various dispatcher educational courses as a hard lesson to ask for the address of the victim before anything else, since if she would have given it up front, she would likely have been given help sooner, with a sliver of a possibility at still being alive. The internet is undoubtedly a weird place. Creepy and disturbing real life events can pop up on you at any time, and tonight's installment exemplified this. If you, for some reason, haven't yet subscribed to Scare Theater, go over there and give him a sub and a big thank you for jumping in this with me. He's one of my bigger inspirations and it was awesome to have him on. Anyway, to close, thank you all for joining me in volume 6 of Disturbing Things from Around the Internet. If you have any other bite-sized, disturbing internet events or oddities on hand, feel free to throw them my way. I'd love to consider your recommendations for a future installment. With that being said, I'll see you in the next one. I love you all, and good night. <laughs>